Etefano Artecaraiti. Welcome to this holy table. Welcome to you, for we are Christ's body. Christ's work in the world. Welcome to you, whose baptism makes you salt of the earth and light to the world. Rejoice and be glad. Praise God who gives us forgiveness and hope. Amen. Amen. Christ is our light, the joy of our salvation. Praise and glory to Christ, God's new beginning for humanity. Making ritual water, gospel wine, cleansing all our worship. Love and loyalty to Christ, who gives us the gospel. Praise to Christ, who calls us to our lives. Christ is the living water, cleansing, refreshing, making all things new. Christ is the living bread, food for the hungry, strength for the pilgrim and the labourer. So now we offer our thanks for the beauty of these silence, for the wild places and the bush, for the mountains, the coast and the sea. We offer thanks and praise to God for this good land, for its trees and pastures, for its plentiful crops, and the skills we have learned to grow them. Our, Our thanks for the mind for science and discoveries, for our Please be seated for the confession. We come seeking forgiveness for all we have failed to be and do as members of Christ's body. In God there is forgiveness. Loving and seeing God, forgive us where we have failed to support one another and to be what we claim to be. God forgives us. Be at peace. Rejoice and be glad, for Christ is resurrection. Reconciliation for all the human race. We shall all be one in Christ, one in our life together. Praise to God who has created us. Praise to God who has accepted us. Praise to God who sends us into the world. The sentence for today. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the collect we pray together. God of glory, fill your church with the power that flows from Christ's resurrection, so that in the midst of this broken world, it may signal the beginning of renewed humanity. Raise to new life with Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God for ever and ever. Amen. Continue with the reading. This will not be in Tongan. <laughs> the Spirit of God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, 
to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 9, beginning at the sixth verse. The point is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. <coughs> through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. We shall continue with the gradual hymn.
In the name of God, creator, redeemer, and life bearer. Amen. May I first of all, on behalf of Archbishop David, uh, Tereiti, Kiri, Taro, Drea, and Awatia, the whole family, uh, thank you so much for being here today, for this expression of love, and for this expression of who we are as a diocese. A special uh, welcome and word of appreciation, uh, Bishop Aries, from the Diocese of Kuching. Uh, our companion relationship with that diocese goes back now beyond the number of years that I've been in the diocese, so that's more than 14, and it's a relationship, Bishop, that we value highly. And uh, we have experienced your extraordinary hospitality. Uh, we hope that we can show you a little bit in return. Welcome. To the Moxon family, my goodness me, Awatia, she was six years old. Claire was six and a half. They climbed a tree outside St Peter's Cathedral in the middle of a service of welcome to us. And when a little boy tried to climb the tree too, they, and they won't tell us which one of them said this, apparently said to the little boy, this is for bishops' daughters only. <laughs> and Kerry, my goodness me, still in school uniform, and I think, you know, when you walked up on your dad's arm up the aisle, and I had that moment of glory where you walked towards me before he shouldered me out of the way and took on the rest of the service. <laughs> but I think I probably wept more than him. And as for Tiaro and Terea, well, I think, Archbishop, our enduring memory will be of us puffing our way up Taranaki, looking across at each other and thinking, oh, if he can keep doing it, I have to keep doing it. <laughs> and looking up ahead of us and seeing our, our three boys and my 67-year-old father-in-law powering up the mountain, leaving us behind. We had Sherpas, we had people carrying our bags. <laughs> and Tereiti. Well, how many nights did we end up sitting in front of the television? Well, if I confess, I slept in front of the television, you slept in front of the television. He had already given up and gone to bed. We'd talk. And the length of time that we'd talk would depend on when I fell asleep mid-sentence and you'd nudge me and say, go on, go off to bed. You've woven me into the life of your family and I'm not going to let you go. Actually, none of us are going to let you go. David, this is a unique gift through God's grace that we've been given and I will cherish it always. And I look forward to the way we will share each other's lives into the future. If I had to characterise one element, one characteristic of this relationship, which I will celebrate always, then it is quite simply laughter. Uh, it didn't take, and it doesn't take very long for us to be in the same room together before one of us is in fits of laughter at something the other has said. But I think one of the most memorable moments was when Archbishop David and I, dressed in our purple clericals, but in the John Sentamu mode, which means that the white bit was out, to a Thai restaurant here in Hamilton. It was kind of dark, the lighting wasn't great, there was hardly anyone else in there, we wanted takeaways. We were standing there, there was actually only one other couple in the restaurant, and someone came in and they looked at us and placed their order. <laughs> Now the problem was that the only other couple in the restaurant was the assistant priest at the cathedral of the time and her husband. So that story has gone around. I have to say too that I need to make very clear before I carry on that there are two methods of sermon preparation uh, that the two bishops of this diocese have. There's the Moxon method, which is three points on the back of a used envelope point one, two and three and what really ticks me off about this particular method is he then comes back into the office the next day, transcribes word for word what he said and it ends up in a book that people buy. <laughs> then, 
then you've got the Richardson method of preparation. And what have we got? About 14 pages. That'll keep you going. But David, because I know that you, you, know, you need to have a little bit of a, a guide as uh, you work through a sermon, I've got the three key points here for you. <laughs> well, if there were three readings that could reflect the character of this man, they're the three readings that we've just heard. It's true to say that we are not saved by good works. But it's equally true that our works reveal our character. They reveal our character as individuals and as a community. As Christian communities, we desire to be a church. We are committed to be a church that gives itself away. We are called to express solidarity with the most vulnerable. So Isaiah 61 is just the perfect reading. The perfect reading to remind us of an essential element in the character of this man, this bishop, and an essential element in our character as church. In the gospel reading, basin and towel, those evocative images of the suffering servant, the only way a God of love, a God who creates autonomous creatures exercising free will, can possibly intervene, is to take on to oneself, onto God's self, the suffering of the other. So at the deepest level, this servanthood, this servant ministry is about compassion, sharing in the passion, the suffering of another. And the purpose of such compassion is to bring healing and wholeness to all that would distort the gift of life. Anything that would distort the purposes of God. The supreme example of that is God hanging on a cross, arms outstretched. God has been there before us. It's already achieved. It's already given to us as a gift. But it's also a call and a challenge to live in that way. A call and a challenge to do likewise. So basin and towel, diakonia, servant ministry, compassion, serving God, serving others, even willing to suffer with and for others, that healing and wholeness and life might be experienced by all. That's the unique call that's placed on us as Christians. An absolutely unique call. And it's the Christian gift. It's the gift of the cross. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul outlines the principles of generous giving. Perhaps a little bit more colloquially than than Paul expresses it, but Really, he says, no one's ever lost through being generous. But giving's like sowing, like sowing a seed. You sow generously, you reap generously. But the rewards are never material. There's no prosperity gospel here. The generous person will be rich in love. The generous person will be rich in friends. The generous person is rich in the help that they offer to others. The generous person is rich towards God. What we do for others, we do for God. Paul insists it's the happy giver that loves God and that God loves. Thomas Carlyle, a great Scottish philosopher, you can see that I trained in a Presbyterian institution, tells the story of when a boy, a beggar, came to their house. His parents were out and he was alone. And on a boyish impulse, he broke into his savings bank and he gave the beggar everything that he had. Carlyle tells that never before or since had he felt such sheer joy as came to him at that moment. I have to say, one of the other things that Thomas Carlyle said was this, I have a great ambition to die of exhaustion rather than boredom. Paul insists that God can give to us both the sustenance to give and the spirit in which to give. It's great, isn't it, the way sometimes a word or a verse leaps out at you in a new way. And here, tucked into verse 8 of chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, is a real gem. The verse speaks of all sufficiency of, of the all-sufficiency of God. And the word in Greek used is atakeia. 
This word does not describe the sufficiency of the person who possesses all kinds of things in abundance. It describes the state of the person who has taught him or herself to be content with very little. Hmm. To be content with very little. Such a person will be able to give far more to others because they want so little for themselves. A passion for justice, the suffering servant, a generous giving heart. But let me speak of another characteristic, a gospel characteristic that I have experienced through this man, through this bishop, through this family. It's the insight, the life-transforming insight of the poet. And I want to tell you the story. It's a story of Frederick the Field Mouse. Sounds poetic, doesn't it? Just hang in there. So, you've got to transport yourself to the Northern Hemisphere. There's a family of mice gathering food against the harsh winter. All that is except Frederick. And Frederick was just kind of wandering around. Having a look here, having a look there. Summer came, autumn came. They gathered and they gathered and they gathered. Frederick just walked around, looking here, looking there. They challenged him. They said, Frederick, why won't you help us? Why won't you work with us? We're trying to build what we need to survive the cold, harsh winter. Frederick said, well, look, I'm gathering sun's rays for the cold winter, and I'm, I'm gathering colours for the grey days ahead. They weren't very impressed with that. Gathering words for long winter's nights? Gathering colours for grey days? That's not going to keep them alive. They kept working, he kept wandering. And winter came, food dwindled, their heads were down. They didn't think they would survive. And then someone remembered Frederick's supplies. And he told them stories. Stories of summer sun and warmth. And strangely, the cold just seemed to recede out of their bones. Their heads came up and they started to look at each other again. He told them of a summer world, of red poppies, of yellow wheat, of green leaves, of mines that just were filled with colours. And so then at last came these words, a great poem celebrating life in its four seasons as winter gave way to spring, giving way to summer, giving way to autumn and winter again. Words filled the dark, cold winter night and the promise of spring. Frederick, they cried, you're a poet. Don't I know it, said Frederick. <laughs> you know, the poet, the one who helps us interpret the world in a new and fresh way, the one who can tell us about the colour and who can give us the words to describe the indescribable. That person gives us life. David, you have come with grace. You bring courtesy and respect towards others. You have brought a constant belief in the goodness of every person in spite of any evidence to the contrary. A willingness to extend to every person a 70 times 7 multiple of forgiveness and grace. A deep and unrepentant passion for justice and reconciliation in this land. A profound, almost excruciating empathy for those who are suffering. Justice, compassion, a generosity of spirit and living. These are the gifts, the indelible gifts, that you have imbued into this diocesan family. You are indeed a poet, and your words, the words of the gospel, are woven into our life, and we are profoundly and deeply in your debt. We continue now with the intercessions and thanksgiving. <coughs> Let us pray for the church and for the world, giving thanks for God's goodness. The interse intercessions will be led by the Venerable Anne Mills, Mrs. Karen Morrison-Hume, 
and to the venerable Lois Sines. To the bidding, risen God, in your mercy, I invite you to respond with hear our prayer. Risen God, in your mercy. Praise and honour to you, Jesus Christ, for you have triumphed gloriously. We pray for the world, for the welfare of all your people, and for your creation entrusted to our care. For all in positions of authority, for men and women in their daily work. Roll away the stones of hatred and greed. Transform us with your spirit of justice and righteousness, that all your people may share in the freedom of your risen life. Risen God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Praise and honour to you, Jesus Christ, for you have cancelled the power of sin. We pray for the worldwide church, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for the people of this land. Roll away the stones of discord and unbelief. Transform your church with your spirit of wisdom and truth, that we may be in the world a witness to your risen life. Risen God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Praise and honour to you, Jesus Christ, for you show us the mighty power of love. We pray for the communities in which we live and work, for the forgotten and undervalued people of society. Roll away the stones of apathy and selfishness. Transform our lives with your spirit of love and forgiveness that we may share in the joy of your risen life. Risen God, in your mercy. Praise and honour to you, Jesus Christ, for you bring us hope when all seems lost. We pray for all who suffer, for the hungry and the homeless, the lonely and friendless, for the sick and sorrowing and all who care for them. Roll away the stones of pain and despair. Transform the lives of all who suffer with your comfort and balm, that they may share in the hope of your risen life. Risen God, in your mercy. Praise and honour to you, Jesus Christ, for you have broken the bonds of death. We give you thanks for your faithful people of every age, for Mary Magdalene, Peter and John, and for all who have seen you and believed. May we, following their example and yours, cast off all that binds us in death, Transform our lives by your risen power, that we, with all your saints, may come to share forever in the glory of your risen life. Risen God, in your mercy. Praise and honour to you, Jesus Christ, for you have called your people to follow in your way. We give you thanks for your gifts of ministry and grace, 
witnessed through your servants David and Tereti and their family. May your ongoing faithfulness, grace and love support them on this new journey. Transform our lives by your grace that we may know the fullness of your risen life. Risen God, in your mercy. Amen. The Cathedral Choir will now lead us in the Lord's Prayer in love. <coughs> The peace of Christ be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace, shake their hands and say, Peace or the peace of Christ or Bongi Kyoto Trangi Mari.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Lift your heart to heaven. Christ in glory reigns. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to offer thanks and grace. It is the joy of our salvation, God of the universe, to give you thanks through Jesus Christ. You said, let there be light. There was light. Your light shines on in our darkness. For you, the earth has brought forth life in all its forms. You have created us to hear your word, to do your will, and to be fulfilled in your love. It is right to thank you. You sent your Son to be for us the way we need to follow and the truth we need to know. You sent your Son to give his life, to release us from our sin. His cross has taken our guilt away. Christ is risen from the dead. Love has come again. Christ is sovereign over space and time. You send your Holy Spirit to strengthen and to guide, to warn and to revive your church. Therefore, with all your witnesses who surround us on every side, countless as heaven stars, we praise you for our creation and our calling. With loving and with joyful hearts, Holy God, holy and merciful, holy and just, glory and goodness come from you. Glory to you, most high and gracious God. Blessed are you most holy in your Son, who washed his disciples' feet. I am among you, he said, as one who serves. On that night before he died, he took bread, and gave you thanks. He broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you, shed for all, to forgive sin. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. Therefore, with this bread and wine, we recall your goodness to us. God, God of the past and the present, we will be your Son. We thank you for his cross and rising again. We take our action on this ascension. We look for his coming in glory. And in the name we give ourselves to you. Send your Holy Spirit, that we who receive Christ's body may indeed be the body of Christ. And we who share his cup draw strength from the one true vine. Call to Father Christ, help us to reconcile the to night. Call to Son, give us hope in our glory. For you, the Heavenly One, make all things new. You are the beginning and the end, the last. And the first. Praise, glory, and love be yours, this and every day, from us and all people, here and everywhere. Amen. <coughs> Christ's body was broken for us on the cross. Christ is the tree of life. His blood was shed for our forgiveness. Christ is risen from the dead. Come God's people. Come to receive Christ's heavenly food. Everyone is welcome at this table. If it's not your preference or custom to receive the bread and wine, feel free to come forward and place your right hand on your shoulder for a blessing. Now my haremai kiteni
Christ, you are risen from the dead. We are risen with you. May our life never deny this eternal life, this peace and hope and joy. Praise and glory to the God of life, who is stronger than all kinds of death. Hallelujah. Blessed be God who calls us together. Praise God who makes us one people. Blessed be God who has forgiven our sin. Praise God who gives us Blessed be God whose word is proclaimed. Praise God who is the Blessed be God who alone has called us. Therefore we are for all that we are, and all that we shall become. Accept, O God, our sacrifice of praise. Amen. Accept our thanks for all we have done. Amen. Please be seated, everybody. We now come to that part of the service in the farewell where a number of people from both within the church and the community uh, wish to say a few things to and about Archbishop David. We'll have six speakers. The first, appropriately, is Archbishop Brown Ture to Pihopa Aotearoa and Pihopa Kete Tairawhiti. He, of course, shares the primacy with Archbishop David and Archbishop Winston. Archbishop Brown.
ai ga mana ga deo ga kara kana ga to ma ha kai wang ni ya ku tu kai ti me a me te tang ya no o te ahu o te nei fa ka hai re ata ta e por por aki nei te ni o ta ta o he atu e ko nei a ka hai re ki wang ni te popa o roma no hoi Ah, tu mano kia ke kawa i e diro i tera, e ka ke diro mai tera i atata. No reina David, a neida a toiwi e mihi nei e tangi nei e ahua fakaro a dua boko hai e ka diko te mea nui ia a ko kara ka tia ko i te nei turanga. Hai de idu nga mana kita nga tu nga rawa, hai de hoki nga mana kita nga atohi mau, <hesitation> efa nga atu de ito wa e hoki mai e koe, wa e nia nor ya tata. Ah, my first recollection meeting seeing. Uh, David was as a young priest in uh, Havelock North. Uh, what surprised me most of all and gave me the thought that there must be something special about this guy because I heard that he had married one of the beauties from Pahawera. <laughs> And that takes some persuading. <laughs> They don't come easy, those Pahawera women. <laughs> And of course, the second uh, recollection that I have was when he was vicar of. Uh, um, oh, God. Gate Park. When their children were quite small, and and to see them come through that ordeal uh, was gratifying. But most of all, when he we became the three prongs of this church, and um, the satisfying thing for. Both Bishop Davis and I was that when it, when was anything Pakeha or had to write out something, David, you you know the language better than we do. <laughs> <laughs> and of course he obliged as he would, and uh, I think our uh, Kaikoho uh, uh, referred to his ability with words. And uh, he has that happy knack of putting things down, and uh, although it might be contentious, but uh, somehow or other it sounds good. <laughs> uh, so uh, we will miss you. Um, somebody said, uh, Oh, that's good. Now we've got a watering hole in uh, Rome. <laughs> And I believe already there have been bookings for, <laughs> for particularly the Maoris who are always wanted to, to travel on the cheap sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so David, you have a whakapapa to this place, not only to this diocese but to the whole province of, of New Zealand. And, uh, It's that for a papa that will remind you always that uh, no matter where you go, uh, you can't get rid of us. <laughs> you will always be ours. And as you have always done in the past, handing out goodies to people, uh, I'm pleased to say that I like to do the same. Uh, 
is our flex cross, which you will hang on the walls of the Vatican uh, of your office. <laughs> And there's a small Fakaro from the Opetaho Aotearoa. Do whatever you like with it. Do reda tēnā koe, kia mau tro, kia tātutun te atu kia koe ngā wākatoa, me tō whāta. Our next speaker is uh, speaking on behalf of Tikanga Pacifica, uh, Archbishop Winston Halapur, Bishop of uh, Polynesia and uh, Archbishop of Tikanga Pacifica. He has also shared primacy with Archbishop David. Archbishop Winston. Tapu pea moe a fio aama si hova. Moe hau eik a ki nau tolu a e whanua o Aotearoa. First, I won't apologize, but I came late. <laughs> it's amazing you can pave your way from different island states in the Pacific to arrive at Auckland and between Auckland and Hamilton I was totally lost. <laughs> I left out there on New Zealand four years ago. I look at technology and the map they have, many of them, as they were four years ago. Today, when I came, I am amazed with the speedness of the development here in Hamilton. But the good news is this. I stopped five times to ask about this school. Some were old. They came from different walks of life. When I mentioned this school, they knew this school. And I think it's something for us to be grateful for as the Free Dikanga Church. And so I'm here. I'm supposed to read to you Isaiah chapter 61. And because I came late, I sum up Isaiah 61 in this ancient Polynesian word, Manawa. The beginning of this powerful passage from Isaiah. The Manawa of the Lord was upon me. Incredible that when Jesus wanted to summarize his mission, he turned to this passage in Luke. The manava of the Lord is upon me. And manava is not the breath, it's more than that. It's the everything of God that we know and other parts we do not know. That is the manava. And here in this passage, the message is simple and straightforward. When God is in the situation, everything is godly. And so, I travel by canoes to arrive here, simply to say, to Archbishop David, you have been an agent of God's manava. 
And things that we saw in you, the way how you sang, the way how you laugh, the way how you talk, and the way how you lead worship, and the way how you chair the meeting and so forth. All what I can say this afternoon. We saw the manava of God in all your life, ministry, and the way how you go about with the church, the family, and the wider community. I came to stand alongside the Archbishop when we were both engaged as leaders in our theological education for a number of years. Then the second part, my colleague came to ordain me as a bishop. And then he came again to honor us, Polynesia, in my position as diocesan bishop and also Archbishop. I return today to say simply how grateful I am for normally we say great things when we don't hear anything we already passed away. <laughs> Archbishop David I'm very, very proud and honored on behalf of Polynesia that we say it before God and before you that you have been God's dharma for Polynesia and our free Tikanga Church. And that dharma, you taught us that song before I heard it here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. He came singing loud. I come today to say, you leave us as our town to our fellow Christians in Rome. If you feel lonely one day, remember my word. Your sisters and brothers on the canoes, way down in the depth of the ocean, will continue to sing, to sing that powerful manava of God. He came singing loud. <coughs> Thank you for those who devised the liturgy and gave me the honor to read Isaiah 61, and especially the reader was not here. <laughs> so you can read it in your language, so when we finish today, you will remember the Manawa. <coughs> God's gift of the Archbishop David to Polynesia is summed up in this ancient concept it's which Jesus Christ himself referred to. The manava of the Lord has come upon me. So thank you to the family and thank you to this diocese and thank you for our sisters and brothers who are here for your town of Archbishop David. Archbishop, if I may put it this way, I send a message that we need a present to give to you. And this morning when they actually unfold the present, I said to them, please, this present is supposed to go to Rome. And I said, I only to cut that middle part. And young ones are so practical. They said, Dad, if you cut only the middle part, what about the rest? 
of this present. I said we may find a way of dealing with the rest. Take the heart, cut it out, and Bishop, the idea of giving this to you, so you don't keep it, please. If someone from Rome talks about ancient Rome and recites about ancient Rome and their history, please return that Correro with a present and say, I have some here, something here from our ancient context. And I mean what I said. What it is here has been ancient civilization too. I now turn to my sisters and brothers. He gifted us, he came singing love. May I ask you to share that gift with me, together with Polynesia. He came singing love and he Speaking on behalf of Tikanga Pakiha, Kaz, where are you? You're hiding. Kaz Young, she is, Kaz is the coordinator of the Order for St. Stephen in New Zealand and a member of the Interdiocesan Conference for the Diocese of Wellington. Uh, Kaz uh, has a passion for, uh, amongst other things, enabling young people to walk with God. Kaz. Kia ora, Liho. greetings. For those who know me well, they know that I am not actually a fan of public speaking. I normally get up to speak when I disagree with something or when I have a strong opinion about something. Thankfully, it's not the first. <laughs> However, today it is my privilege to speak on behalf of Te Pākehā. Over the years, we've come to see David as an amazing storyteller engaging speaker with a singing voice to match, a wise, considerate and prayerful man who is also grounded and humble. His excellent te reo and humour are some of his well-known attributes, not to mention his servant leader character. There is much more that could be added to that list, and I'm tempted to stop right there and just finish off in thanks right now. However, to do so would not honour what we have been blessed with over the many years as Bishop and Archbishop. I remember when I first met Archbishop David, when in 2008 he came down to the Hutt Valley to my parish in Waifatu. I must confess, I don't remember what role he played during services that day, let alone what he said. But I remember how excited my parish was about the certain Archbishop. Now, at this stage, I was a baby Anglican, new to the Fano and unaware of our church structure. I quickly came to realise how much of a gift it is when a bishop, let alone an Archbishop, spares some limited time and energy to visit. What I do remember was this friendly, grounded sort of person in a bright purple shirt. An interesting first impression. Fortunately, over the next few years, the impression continued to develop and grow. 
Through the past three general synods, I have witnessed your diplomatic ability, facilitation skills, fantastic humour, your well-spoken kōrero and te reo, beautiful singing, all of which will continue to serve you well. Personally, I have been encouraged by you to lead conversations, empowered if not thrown into the deep end, to develop and grow, and supported by you in this arena of the Church. The Anglican religious life in Aotearoa, New Zealand, has also benefited from your input, with your guidance, wisdom and passion and prayers. Some of our groups have had the additional blessing in your role as Bishop Protector and Overseer. Ever since I have been involved in National Youth Adventures, your presence has been a constant, full of knowledge, wisdom, patience and willingness to engage deeply has touched the lives of many, and I'm sure will continue to do so. We will also miss the pancakes at Parachute, made by your capable hands. What I've really come to appreciate is your willingness to engage with the grassroots, with justice, all in a passionate and humble way. Last year, when I sent out a challenge to Tikanga Pākehā bishops to participate in the Live Below the Line campaign, I didn't anticipate any to live on $2.25 for food per day for a week. My first response was from Archbishop David, which was very positive and supportive. However, it was not until a few weeks later that I realised he was actually stepping up to the challenge with a real action when he told me over a meal, I've been practising. <laughs> Not only did the Anglicans below the line raise $11,000 for various organisations working against extreme poverty, but it also challenged us personally as Christians. Word also has it that a certain couple of bishops lost a few kilos. <laughs> So indeed, David is an amazing storyteller, engaging speaker, with great singing voice, and also a wise, considerate and prayerful man, still grounded and humble, with an excellent tarao, good humour and servant leadership. But there is also so much more through each of our stories and interactions with you, David. We are so thankful for the blessing of God, of your ministry, your presence and being, for all that you, Tsereti, your children and family in Fano have done, contributed and sacrificed in your time as Bishop and Archbishop. We acknowledge how truly blessed we have been, having shared the path with you, shaping not only your waistline, how add colour to your hair, and encouraged and enriched you on the journey. We wish you all the best in your new adventures. Knowing that the Tonga we have received and enjoyed will be shared well beyond our shores, in and beyond Rome. With that, we thank you and send you with all the love, peace, joy and prayers of Tikanga Pākehā gathered here and in each corner of New Zealand. God bless. Bishop Philip uh, introduced some little time ago, Bishop Aries, bringing greetings from the Diocese of Kuching, uh, a partner diocese to the Diocese of Waikato and Taranaki, and I now ask Bishop Aries uh, to speak. Trobatu mari ke balam nyadi kita di daisies di kuchendian aku natai ke 
Selamat dalam Kristus Dari semua bala kita yang kebisik itu Bagi dengan Archbishop kita di dekat Paduk Mangku pengawak baru Dengan Bishop Philip di dekat Dengan Archbishop kita That's the Iban language um, Our Diocese of Kuching is more or less like the Dice province of uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand We use seven languages in our worship and the one I just used is one, Iban language. First, I'd like to bring our heartiest greetings from the Diocese of Kuching, your companion diocese. And I'm so privileged and happy to be part of this beautiful occasion. Not so much in terms of saying farewell to Bishop, Archbishop David, but because of what he is to our diocese in Kuching and to you people here. Archbishop Winston said he arrived by canoe. I flew 12 hours from Kuching yesterday and arrived about midnight just to be part of this. But over the years we have valued our companionship link which was started in 1995 when Reverend Noel Shire came and visited our diocese and started a link, but it did not really get off that actively <coughs> until your previous dean, John Fairbrother, brought a group of 10 to visit Kuching. I was the dean then, and from that on, then onwards, we have been exchanging many visits, and a lot of you have been to Kuching, and I think Bishop David and Bishop Philip have been there a few times and we really value that link and uh, we look forward to more of you coming and only last year Bishop uh, Philip brought a group from Taranaki and uh, we are we were very excited and we are still hoping that more of you will come and encourage us in our diocese. I bring greetings on behalf of the people and the clergy of the Diocese of Kuching, and especially our diocesan bishop, Archbishop Bali, who happened to be the primate of Southeast Asia. He is not able to be here this afternoon because he just came back from England for the interment of the new Archbishop of Canterbury. And so I stand in his presence to say how much we have appreciated uh, your encouragement in fostering and encouraging the link between our two dioceses and for the way that you have enriched our diocese by your presence, your coming into our diocese and uh, Archbishop David and Bishop Philip have been part of our diocesan occasions many times in the past and we are very happy to uh, return that favor by my presence here this morning. We are very happy also because after this Archbishop David will be taking up a very senior ambassador ambassadorial appointment in Rome and I think in God's timing, this is no coincidence that the new Pope comes from the farthest part of the globe, Argentina. And our ambassador to Rome, Archbishop David, also comes from the farthest part of the Southern Hemisphere on this side of the world. And probably you may be able to walk something out. There's some very encouraging signal from Vatican. And who knows, in God's timing, reconciliation between our two great churches may be in the offing. And so we would like to convey our prayers, our congratulations and best wishes to you and to Raiti as you take up residence in Vatican among the Romans. And we have a little gift from the diocese, and can I invite my wife Anna to come along and Tarati to come 
forward also to receive something from us. This is uh, like an advanced stall, uh, which the ladies wear as part of their custom. It is hand woven by our weavers. <coughs> and Vice Bishop David, a uh, vest, I'm fed with your coat. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I can finish without thanking uh, my good friend Bishop Philip for welcoming me just now and we extend our heartiest congratulations also on his election as your new primate or co-primate if you like uh, in the Church of New Zealand. I'm sure that under uh, Archbishop Philip the link between our two companion dioceses will continue to grow from strength to strength. God's blessing upon one another. Thank you. Thank you, Archbishop. We now have the final speaker before the presentation on behalf of the diocese, and it's appropriate that this is from uh, uh, Tim McIndoe, Member of Parliament. Uh, speaking on behalf of the community in which uh, Archbishop David has lived for some years. Tim. Tanatata Katoa Namihi Nui Kia Kota. It is a great pleasure and a privilege for me to be invited to echo the many wise observations of the previous speakers and to talk on behalf of elected representatives of our community and the community as a whole. And also to be able to express personal thanks for all that Archbishop David has meant to me and to my family in the exactly 20 years that we have now lived in the Waikato. And I say that because it is, of course, exactly the same period that Bishop David has been our bishop in this region. While I first met and heard Bishop David preach and was instantly impressed, I have to say, in 1993, I'm aware that his appointment as the youngest bishop of his generation or his era came as no surprise to those who had known him since his early years. Back in the late 70s, and we've heard from previous speakers that he moved around a great deal in his ministry, but back in the late 70s, a young Anglican curate commenced his ministry at St. Luke's Church in Havelock North, which has a special place in our hearts as the place where Anne and I were married about a decade later. A teenage girl and her mother participated in a Lenten series conducted by that young curate. They were captivated not only by that rich, wonderful voice that we could all listen to for so long, those wonderfully modulated tones, but also by that very mature, from a young man as he was then, still is, I might add, <laughs> <laughs> and spirit-filled insights. Clearly here was a man of great gifts, of rare gifts, of deep intellect, and an, even, and an even deeper faith. My mother-in-law, and could I say to all the young men who are here, it is very wise always to appreciate the wisdom of your mother-in-law. My mother-in-law instantly picked him as one who would go very far in the church. And so when she visited us 15 or so years ago in our home, or more than that probably, she wasn't at all surprised to find that he had become our bishop. She might even have predicted that he would end up Anglican primate or co-primate in New Zealand. But I doubt that even she would have predicted your path to the Holy See. <laughs> 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 
But with the election of the new pontiff, it's a time, of course, of great optimism, freshness, and opportunity in the worldwide church. And who better to serve our Anglican communion and to utilize his many talents in such a climate, in such a time of hope and opportunity as Archbishop David Moxon. When I first came to the Waikato, I did so in a capacity in a school, Sister School, St Peter's School from Cambridge. And I want to acknowledge on behalf of all the schools, it's so appropriate that here we are at St Paul's today in this beautiful chapel, what a great supporter you have been to the Anglican schools in our diocese. And I know that you have been not only deeply supportive because that's who you are, but also because of your deep conviction that our young people are the future of our church, that's almost self-evident, but that our Anglican schools have such an important role to play in ensuring that future is one where we still have a love of our God. And I do acknowledge on behalf of all the schools in our community the great support that you have given. Immediately before attending this service today, Anne and I were at a function out in the country and mentioned that we would have to leave early and said why. And it led to a conversation amongst those with whom we were standing about the amazing opportunity that this role presents and how encouraging it is that the relationship between the Anglican and the Roman Catholic churches has matured and evolved to this point and how much May I say, Bishop David, we enjoyed listening to you on Spiritual Outlook last week. I'm sure many of you would have heard that program as you talked about the history of this position. It's inconceivable that such a position could have existed when my father was a child, and yet now it is something that we celebrate and can look forward to having an enduring impact. And indeed, Archbishop David is ideally suited to the challenges of this, his new role. Being such a gifted communicator, a wise counsellor, and one who instantly commands attention and respect, one who listens, and I do mean listens, who engages, who reflects. Archbishop David, you radiate wisdom, grace, kindness, and faithful witness. Our diocese and our community have been richly blessed for 20 years. You therefore leave us now, and we all feel great sadness as you do so, but with our blessing, with our heartfelt thanks, with our prayers and with our love, we all feel great pride in your appointment. May Fakanuia etata kiakaha. May God bless and protect you, Tureti, and your family in all that lies ahead, and keep you safe until we meet again. Now time for the diocesan presentation to Archbishop David. You've already heard from Bishop Philip much of what the diocese would want to say. I'm conscious that standing here both at the time and of the fact that MCs traditionally are to you know, keep people awake with uh, witty jokes uh, and fill in the gaps. I'm not too good on witty jokes, and I've been told too often by the Archbishop that most of mine are theologically unhygienic. <laughs> so I'm, I, I'm not going to try that. I know, I suspect better than many, the work of Archbishop David. I've had the privilege of being his Chancellor for 14 or 15 years. When he asked me to do that job, he explained to me that it was in the main keeping him out of jail. <laughs> it's sometimes, and I suspect wrongly reported, that I turned and walked the other way down the aisle at that stage. But we have managed it. <laughs> it it's not always been easy. <laughs> No, no, this is, this is true. There are, no, there are no jokes here. David, like all of us, 
has from time to time difficulties with his children. I, I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> but I do vividly recall an incident at St Aidan's Parish in Claudelands in about 1993. The vicar was Archdeacon Emeritus Reg Nicholson. The new bishop and his family uh, were at the service. The bishop was where you'd expect him to be. To rate, he came to take communion with an unnamed child. <laughs> Those who were administering didn't realise that this young child was well versed in what was expected and passed her by with the wine. I want wine! <laughs> was the instant response. <laughs> David, I'm, I'm sure control has improved on occasion since then. <laughs> but there have been both national and international incidents where it's been a close run thing. <laughs> Nationally, some of you may remember Moxon and the Casino Control Authority. I had some difficult times then. I was wondering how I was going to extricate the bishop from the debtors' prison <laughs> when he was unable to pay the costs, having lost in the Court of Appeal. Fortunately, the successful party didn't insist on payment. And there was the other incident, of course, when he went to protest the French nuclear tests at Mururoa. Unpleasant things have been known to happen to people who did that. And I think it was only the fact that he went on a New Zealand warship that stopped the French from trying to imprison him. <laughs> so you might think that he was joking when he said the task was to keep him out of jail. Uh, but I'm not sure that he was. <laughs> Bishop David has led the diocese by himself until Bishop Phillips arrived some 14 years ago. He's worked under enormous pressure. He's shown huge compassion and care for people at all levels. He's pushed himself all hours of the day and night. In fact, I think his going to Rome will be light relief. The curie has got nothing on the Anglican Church in New Zealand. <laughs> we wish you, David, all of the best. You go with our love and our prayers, and we now have uh, gifts for you at Tarati. Would you please come up to Please don't have to. David, the gift for you is a ponamu koru, a symbol of new beginnings. The koru has been handcrafted specifically for this presentation, and it will be mounted on ancient swamp kauri, a symbol for both the past, the present, and the future. The other part of your gift uh, is uh, in the envelope, and we hope will enable a means for you to keep in contact uh, with your family other than Skype. We've been reflecting over the last couple of hours on 20 years of our relationship, of our friendship. So much has been shared in the context of our everyday lives and the context of our greatest experiences, challenges, tragedies, loves and joys. I'm so conscious that through every relationship I've had, the joy of sharing in this diocese, there is a living hope, a sacred presence through it all. God. For me, this has only been possible because of the faith communities I've had the privilege of 
living and working with throughout this diocese, as well as Aotearoa and the Pacific. I'm so grateful to the presence of so many of you from around Aotearoa, New Zealand, and also the wider Pacific and Southeast Asia, as well as ecumenical partners, other leaders, community leaders uh, from civic and political spheres, as well as friends, family and colleagues. I'm only as good as the company I keep. But I want to uh, begin by thanking my immediate whānau, and I think of Tureiti, Kirihimete, Te Aro, Tureia and Awatea, and also Joan and John Moxon, and all my whānau who raised me in the faith and who've been the wind beneath my wings, and also to um, Rachel and Andy and those members of our wider family, Gwenda, who's here today, my father's sister. They raised me in this faith, and the only reason I'm standing here uh, is because of that heritage. Bishop Philip has been a partner in mission in the very best sense of the, f of the phrase, and I could not imagine diocesan episcopacy here without him. This collegiality has been remarkable and transformational for me. In this liturgy, this farewell Eucharist, the focus is on God, I hope. The word Eucharist means to give thanks to God and is an invitation to link all our pain, sorrow and disappointment to Jesus' sacrificial death and all our joys and hopes and success to his rising. We've had cause for celebration over the last 20 years and for the recognition of how far God has brought us. We can give thanks for so much. Where there has been cause for regret or repentance, we've just placed them safely in the hands of the compassionate and forgiving Christ. During this Eucharist, my heart has been full of so much gratitude and the great debt I owe to so many who have supported me, worked alongside me and challenged me. I give thanks to God for those times when, even when I know that my limitations or errors of judgment have had painful consequences for others. I unreservedly ask for your forgiveness if you have been affected in any way by that. Through it all, the good and even the not so good, I think of the synod motifs we use every year, which Tiki Tutarangi Romati coined for this diocese from Taranaki. The mountain is tall and God is good. He maunga teite he tohu kiteatu. The growth is plentiful and God is good. He ngahuru tanga nui he hua moteatu. The river teems and God is good, thinking of Waikato. Ngātini hua o te awa he hummaitanga na te atua. The people of the Church of God are equal to the challenge because God is good. Ka rere te manuka, ka tomokai te iti o te atua. When I was called to the role of Bishop of Waikato 20 years ago, I quoted Archbishop William Temple, a former Archbishop of Canterbury, who said of his hope for the future of Anglican Christianity when he took office. I come with no plan for you, but our hands are in the hands of Christ, and together we will walk into God's new future. I quoted this because I wanted to listen, first of all, and to assist this diocese in listening to itself and to those around us, including those who are marginalised, oppressed or overlooked, as the Bishop of Wellington says, the lost, the least and the last. Over the last 20 years of this partnership and this listening, many ways forward have been revealed. In the body of Christ, listening and finding ways forward bring forth the questions, what is God doing in the world and how can I join God? What is the Spirit saying to the Church? What must we now do? The Spirit has spoken to us in many ways and we have together sought God's will and God's kingdom within the context of our relationships, where it begins and ends for us all and our God-given hopes. I thank my partners in the wider community as well as the Church, many of whom are here today. Progress has sometimes been gradual but always clear in the end. Perhaps the motto would be, if we want to go fast, we should go alone. But if we want to go far, we should go together. I give thanks for how far we have come and wish you every blessing abundance of life and the great joy and hope of the gospel of God. 
And there is a fridge in Rome full of Marmite. <laughs> And the occasional Waikato or, or Tui or Spates. Um, I'm running a little Kiwi booking system, and uh, you're very welcome as long as you can cook. So, <laughs> welcome once, welcome twice, welcome three times to the Anglican Centre in Rome if you're passing through. My daughter Oatea used to sell this kind of thing at Te Kohau Health, at the little shop there, and I'd like to leave this in Charlotte Brown House and ask Denise Ferguson to come forward to receive it. Of course, it picks up two images of Christ. One is the fish hook, being a fisher of people, but also the koru, the unfolding energy of new life and new birth. And uh, can I leave this in Charlotte Brown House as a symbol of my love and my prayer? Mātua tatua koutou e manaki. E tia ki, i ngā wā katoa, kia kaha, kia toa. Hi koi i rotu i te aroha me te rangi mārie a te ariki i tēnei So may the wisdom of God uphold you. May the light of God encircle you. May the peace and grace of God rest upon you and go with you. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, creating, redeeming, life-giving, come down upon you now, this day, and all your days. Amen. Amen. And over this uh, primatial cross to the two archbishops who... Inside the crozier of the Bishop of Waikato, which was given to me by Roger Herft when he left this diocese, found by Fred Graham. And the Copen Mitre that Archbishop Johnson left to Bishops of Waikato. to be worn by the next bishop. As one ministry ends, another begins. And Archbishop Brown has, on behalf of the province, uh, some words for Archbishop David and something approaching a new commission, but not quite. Now that you've relinquished your 
position here as the official wife at all. The, the standing committee and your bishops uh, have agreed that you become Archbishop Emeritus. Friends, it would have been hard to hear uh, at the instigation of uh, the province of Aotearoa New Zealand of Polynesia in recognition and in anticipation of the ministry which Archbishop David has now fulfilled. Uh, he has been invited to carry the title of Archbishop into the future as Archbishop Emeritus. Friends, it's time for us to send this family forward. I'm going to ask uh, Tariti and Kitty and Andy, Taro, Rachel, fiancés get included in this, <laughs> Turaya, and thinking of Awatea, you always have to think of Awatea, uh, to come forward, to allow us to anoint you and to pray for you. Almighty and most gracious God, you work through us, earthen vessels, frail and vulnerable as we are, and somehow your glory is made manifest in us. We give thanks for this family, for the love which binds them, the determination that guides them. We pray your blessing upon each one. Pray for Awatea, for Terea, for Tearo and Rachel, for Kitty and Andy, for Teresi, and for David. Bless and keep them this day and forevermore in your heart as they live in ours. Amen. Serve the Lord, go in peace. Amen. Go in the name of Christ.